How to fix a Spock brow. There's nothing more awkward than sitting in a room with a patient who is complaining about a really horrendous Spock brow that you have just given them. Now the problem with this situation is we don't know as injectors exactly what we've done until two weeks later and it's fully played out. And every patient is different and there are many different ways of injecting patients and they all ask for different things. Even if their anatomy was the same, you'd get different results. So we end up occasionally being in this awkward position. So what can we do to improve a Spock brow if you've already created one? So why does Spock brow happen? The first reason is that many clinicians are really afraid of causing a brow drop, therefore leave lots of muscle untreated above the eyebrows naturally, which will avoid the eyebrows dropping. The downside with this is you can get the opposite problem, which is too much of a lift. Increased activity of the lateral frontalis muscle will cause, a, in a rare number of people, a significantly bigger brow lift than you might expect. And along with that, you can get what is sometimes called Wi-Fi lines. My generation used to call them ladder lines. This is not a true Spock brow because there's another element that comes with a Spock brow, but you're gonna see many of these two, particularly when you start, because so many patients will ask you for a brow lift or you'll be afraid of causing a brow drop and you'll under treat, which is the better course of action than over treating because you can always put more in. So for these patients, you just need to adjust the strength of the frontalis in a way that's safe to do so. So how would you decrease the strength of the lateral frontalis if they're overlifted? It's just one to two injection points edging down the forehead. Now, the lower you get, obviously, the more sensitive it is. So when you first start out, you may divide the active muscle in half and treat the upper half with one unit. If that's not enough, you can treat lower down, but you might use a slightly lower dose if you get all the way down close to where the eyebrow is. I've put in as little as half a unit just to soften the activity of this muscle here. This confuses people because I often talk about it as a safety area, but the truth is it's, it's only a relative risk treating the lateral frontalis. You just need to do it cautiously, and in many patients, you don't get a drop even if you put significant doses in, but it is sensible to start with less and put more in as time goes on if you need it. So what is therefore a true Spock brow? So a true Spock brow is a combination of an over-treated medial frontalis and an under-treated lateral frontalis. And this happens I think more often in newer injectors because they are often trying to be extra safe. So if you think about what the risks are with botulinum toxin, we have the risks of eyelid ptosis, which everyone worries about the most. And one way to reduce that is to stay away from the orbit. So many injectors, instead of injecting right on the corrugator, are a little bit safer in their mind and inject slightly above it, which hits the medial frontalis with a hefty dose of botulinum toxin. This causes a medial brow drop. If they then also been extra safe laterally and made sure they don't get a lateral brow drop, they get the opposite, which is a lateral brow lift, because you've heavily treated the frontalis in the middle, hardly treated at all laterally, and so you get, boom, a Spock brow. So how would you fix this? The first thing is, think about the muscles that are undertreated that are pulling the eyebrow down. If you've treated too high and hit the frontalis, it's quite simple to see what you need to do next, which is we need to treat those brow depressors so that the elevators have a chance of winning. So find the corrugator, and the procerus and relax those muscles because that gives you some chance of elevating the medial brow. At the very least, your patient will look better when they are cross because a little bit of anger when you are, have a Spock brow looks a lot worse. And if you just neutralize that when they do look, when they do try and frown, at least they don't get that really deep frown line that you get when you have unopposed corrugator activity without the frontalis muscle doing anything. So treat the glabella complex properly. And then the next thing is laterally do what we talked about in the previous section, which is put a very low dose here so that you balance the seesawing effect. Think of it broadly as a seesaw. You've basically done this drop in the middle, lift at the top, and instead we want to elevate the middle and soften the lateral lift, and that brings things a little bit closer into harmony. Remember, a lot of getting out of this situation is about communication. If you've made a mistake with your patient, I always find it's better just to explain exactly what caused it so that it will never happen again. Don't just say, this is just a side effect and it happens to everyone, because that makes them feel out of control. Learn from their particular case so that they will never go anywhere else rather than immediately think, well, there's no point having Botox again, or I'm never going there again, because they don't have a way to avoid it in the future. You must come up with a plan of how this is not going to happen again. So if you're going to treat the lateral brow, because a lot of clinicians are afraid of treating this area, here's a simple formula that I use to soften an overly arched eyebrow. If I'm two centimeters from the periorbital ridge, I will confidently put half a unit to one unit. If I'm three or more centimeters away, I will do one unit or two units because it's safer when you've got that much space. Just think about how much muscle you have that's untreated and how much you feel taking away. We know the core 
principle here is that toxin will treat about one to one and a half centimeters of muscle. If you put an injection point in, the area around that muscle will relax. And this helps you gauge how much muscle you are still leaving untreated that will provide some eyebrow support. And nearly always in a female, there should be some eyebrow support. So you can use that formula and those rough estimates of how much to put in at different places to make a decision about how much you can put in. This is harder the older your patients get, simply because as I've talked about in a previous video, which we'll link to at the end, if you treat older patients, it's a bit more like walking on a tightrope. You can still do it, but it's very much easier to fall off either side than when the patient is younger. So what do I do for older patients that spock? The first thing is, you need to learn from each case, communicate with them carefully and make sure they understand why this has happened and what you can do differently. The second thing is consider their face more holistically because often spocking is about a lack of resistance to the muscle where it's elevating. So you get an eyebrow that has no fat above it that lifts very easily in older patients. As you try and relax that muscle, they risk dropping. So sometimes it's appropriate to talk about dermal filler as an alternative because this at least dampens some of the movement and then allows you to put less toxin in to still get rid of the lines. Once who have revolumized the muscle. They are also more prone to the medial drop for the same reasons, which is they have less support in the skin and it's easier for a small dose to cause an imbalance. And so it can also mean that they are not suitable for future botulinum toxin treatments or they have to have a much lighter dose medially so that when you inject them, it's not enough to cause the medial brow drop. For many patients, if the experience is bad enough and they're upset by it enough, it's better not to try again because if you get a very big Spock brow with a very normal type of treatment, there may be something about the patient that makes them very hard to treat with toxin. And I would simplify things and just take it off the table if you're not sure about how to do it again without getting the same negative result. If you want to learn a whole lot more about advanced Botox and all the anatomy that underpins it, make sure you get on the waiting list for my membership. It's in the description down below.